So the next presentation is from Trevor Watkins and his research team. Um, today's presenters are Trevor Watkins, Leo Hughes Watkins, and Valencia Johnson. Um, Watkins is the teaching and outreaching librarian at George Mason University and is the technical lead and chair of the web committee of Project STEND. His research interests include artificial intelligence, STEM librarianship, information literacy integration models, open knowledge diffusion tools, and teaching and learning theories in non-traditional spaces. The title of the presentation is Project STEM Metadata Standards for Student Activism. Well, thank you very much. Um, so thank you all for coming today. Um, the order of the presentation, well, the contributors to this presentation are myself, Leo Hughes Watkins from University of Maryland, Valencia Johnson from Princeton University, Shannon Walker from Arizona State University, and Chris Whitman from Wright State University. The order of the presentation will be Leo Hughes Watkins, then Valencia Johnson, and I will wrap up the presentation. Leo. Hello again, my name is Lel Hughes Watkins and I'm one of the founders for Project Stand. Um, Project Stand is a radical grassroots archival consortium project between colleges and universities um, around the country to create a centralized digital space highlighting analog and digital collections emphasizing student activism in marginalized communities. Project Stand aims to foster ethical documentation of contemporary and past social justice movements in underdocumented student populations. Stand also advocates for collections by collaborating with educators to provide pedagogical support, create digital resources, host workshops and forums for information professionals, academics, technologists, humanists, etc. interested in building communities with student organizers and their allies leading to sustainable relationships and inclusive physical and digital spaces of accountability, diversity, and equity. Um, we officially launched in the summer of 2017 at Ohio State University. Um, we currently include 71 members across the country. That includes private, public, and HBCUs. Um, a part of the, the requirements that we have for our participating members is that they create or um, fill in collection assessment forms. Um, to give us an idea of the holdings that they have at their institution. And we currently have collected 400 collection assessment forms. One of the recent things we are excited that um, we were able to complete, we received the IMLS grant that allowed us to have four symposiums between 2019 and 2020 around the country where we centered the voices of student organizers um, at those institutions. Um, to give us insight into what we need as information professionals and those who want to be allies to build relationships with those student organizers and work with them in documenting their narratives. Um, so to think about um, the practice and ethical practice of metadata, um, we really at this point feel it's been important for us um, as a consortium to establish a lot of inquiry as we're working um, to create um, metadata for um, collections around student organizers, organizing in vulnerable um, student populations. So we asked those questions or created this line of inquiry, not just for activists, but also for the archivists as well. So some of those questions include, do you have safety protocols in place? Do you have a method to anonymize members who do not want to be identified as part of the record? Do you have internal documentation for creating descriptions for documents? Um, again, for student organizers, we also ask that they think about, do they have plans to submit collections to university colleges and archives? Because as you can imagine, as students are organizing, these are the same populations who are having these contentious relationships with their institutions, and they may not feel comfortable um, providing those collections to their um, institution. So sometimes students are, um, documenting within their organization, but are not always at a place where they want to give to their institution. So if they do decide, we, we think that they should think about the metadata that they feel is necessary for to, to include to the archives, and how do they want us to, or how do they plan to preserve the co um, contextualization of their records, because one of the things that we also found out in doing these forums is that students often are concerned 
that the context of the records that they're submitting um, to the institution will get lost and then different narratives um, that they felt should not be intended for their work are created. And then for the archivist, we are um, asking that are you engaging in an ethical approach to metadata on student organizers? And that includes are you utilizing a participatory methodology? Are you working with uh, collaboratively with the students who are um, giving you those acquisitions? Um, does your workflow include methods for mediating the weaponization of metadata for collections on student organizing? Um, as many of us um, should be or are aware um, with um, protests um, that are even occurring um, right now across the country, surveillance has increased um, quite aggressively. Um, and with us working with vulnerable student populations, our intention as archivists should not be to cause more trauma and harm to those communities and, and therefore the records that are being donate, donated are being weaponized against the students that we've worked hard to build um, trust. So at this point, we are in the very early, <laughs> went too far. <laughs> at this point, we are at the very early stages of creating a metadata guide for student organizers working to establish a metadata style guide that will center marginalized student collections um, on, active, on activism and collaborating with students to gain an understanding um, of what is important to them in describing their records. So as we're advocating for students and creators to supply their own metadata so we can ethically describe them, we have over 400 collections that we have to describe in our portal um, as it stands. And we came to the realization that we needed con a controlled vocabulary and a glossary so we're all speaking the same terms. Um, for our controlled vocabulary builder, um, we researched the sources that archivists are more most likely to use, including the Library of Congress subject headings, the Society of American Archivists thesaurus for use in college and university archives, and of course, the local terms that the institutions um, apply themselves. And through this research, we realized that we need to move towards a more local model since Project STAN has a very specific focus on student organizers, and we felt that um, the essay didn't go far enough and then the Library um, Congress subject headings are at times outdated and use oppressive terms and we wanted to make sure we're being as ethical as possible in our description practices. Uh, next slide please. We also wanted to have a common language. Um, a lot of the terms that center around activism work, um, we may think we're saying the same thing, but the nuances and the um, hyper specificity of them um, pushed us to create a glossary so we're all speaking the same things. Um, and bring it under the same um, banner, such as women's rights versus the rights of women. And this helps our collection assessment team collate all the, all the collections together um, so they can um, present them on our website under um, thematic terms. And we are also in the process of updating as we learn more from our members and their collections and from the activists themselves. Next slide. So these two tools um, form together into our collection assessment form um, that every member fills out when they're submitting a new collection for Project Stand. And handing it over to you, Trevor. Thank you, Valencia. Um, so um, as, she, as Valencia just stated, uh, one of the second steps uh, for implementation was to create survey tools for gathering information about potential participants in existing collections. So we had a pre-assessment survey form, which we sent to prospective contributors to assess their institution's ability to support the project and carry out their own site survey of collections pertaining to student descent. And here are a couple of uh, sample questions. Um, we also sent out a collection assessment survey, which uh, was developed to begin to collect data on institution and existing archival collections documenting student activism and marginalized student communities on college campuses. Um, the implementation and collection of surveys en enabled us to collect basic metrics for size and the scope of the project. So um, the survey launched in May uh, 2017. 
Uh, and that was, uh, again, initially locally, and then we expanded that nationwide in August of 2017. Um, and in January 2018, there were 18 participating institutions. As of January of this year, there were 51. There are now currently 71 institutions across the country. Um, in regards to the collection submissions, there were 151 in 2018. Beginning of this year, there were 385, um, currently at 394. Uh, so some of the preliminary findings, um, there are collections of over a dozen thematic categories of campus activism and marginalized student communities. Largest, the largest categories of materials were those representing African-American students, women's rights, civil rights, and Vietnam War protests. Um, many of those collections are considered hidden collections because they're largely unidentified and hidden in larger institutional holdings. Uh, and so as you can see, here are some of the primary sources for student activism and campus protests in the collections. Uh, so student centers, student organizations, student newspapers, su subject file of campus administrators, photographic and audio visual collections, oral histories, ex exhibitions and curated projects, and of course, archives, social media and online content. Um, and so um, the creation, uh, step three was the creation of the Project Stand website. So we have a creation of institutional pages for participating colleges and universities. And again, you can access this at standarchives.com. Um, There's a collection summary and link to protests and social justice collections, feature collection series, aggregated collections data broken down by different criteria. And I'm gonna show you that in a few. Uh, data visualizations and infographics of different types of collections and where they're available. And then of course, the symposiums that, that Leo mentioned earlier, um, those are also posted on our website as well as uh, the archival toolkit. All right, so um, here are a couple of access point, common access points uh, to our collections. Uh, and so as you can see here, you go to our collections, we have that feature collection that I just talked about. This is our collection by theme, collection by chronology, and we're still um, um, uh, working on some of these. Um, but right now, these are the top five that we have. Uh, and, and so if you look over here to the left hand side, we have LGBTQ, and we have African American collections. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about what that looks like. So here's the African American collection. So if you see here on the, and this is an interactive infographic. Uh, so when you, when you uh, hover over one of these icons, uh, it shows you the institution, it shows you the amount of linear feet. Um, what type of papers there were, what format, publication, manuscript, and then for the dates, either a single date or a date range. And here are some of the metadata, um, name of the institution, name of the collection, dates of the collection, the record group identifier, the size of the collection, whether it's linear or cubic feet. If it's digitized, the size of the collection is it in megabytes or, or gigabytes, the decade of the collection, format of the collection, activism topics, and then of course the state. And of course we have other visualizations um, that we try to highlight uh, in the infographic uh, to, for, for researchers and also for archivists. So some of the other things that we are working on um, is labor, political, civil rights, freedom of expression, academic freedom, student rights, uh, social justice, political correctness, and commuter students. Um, also, in the first two years, uh, we didn't have any cybersecurity attacks or any malicious activity. Um, we used one of the, and it's, it's apparent that we're using WordPress, um, but we used one of the WordPress security plugins to manage the firewall database and file system security, spam, and brute force present, um, prevention. Uh, but for some reason, in 2019, during our first symposium, or actually our second symposium, we received a flood of attacks. Um, luckily, none of those were successful because I got a notification while we were sort of in, um, in, in, in um, during the symposium and I was able to go uh, and alter uh, uh, some of the firewall rules and mitigate those attacks. Um, some of the countermeasures that we've put in place is a new firewall configuration. Uh, we've blocked the domain of some of the ISPs because some hackers can hide behind VPNs, and, but we have a tool where we're able to still see the ISP of where, no matter what um, VPN that they're actually using. We have 24-7 monitoring, uh, real-time IP blacklist. Uh, we use 
the WordPress APIs uh, very extensively, vastly developed uh, a couple of other plugins, um, which are called Honeypot uh, plugins. Um, there's two, one is High Interactive Honeypot, one is a Research Honeypot. And this is a way to sort of see how hackers, uh, what particular methods they're using, and um, also to capture um, um, yeah, capture what they're what they're doing to, in order to to develop other countermeasures to to mitigate um, any future cyber attacks. So, future work, um, we are in the process now of applying for another grant um, in which to provide enhanced metadata for collections highlighted in the assessment form. Uh, one of the other projects that we're going to work on also is linking student activism across member and participating institutions using linked data. Um, so we're going to be developing a multi-agent system in order to do that um, and also creating metadata style guide for student activism and collaboration with student organizers. Um, one thing that I also failed to mention is we're using Dublin Core um, in our, our stand digital library. Right now we have a couple of, of uh, papers there. Uh, and so um, we're using Dublin Core metadata for that. We're going to be migrating to Omega S, and we're going to be using the extended Dublin Core uh, plugin uh, for that as well. Um, thank you very much. And if you have any questions. Thank you so much.